The Mismantle Chronicles, Book 1, Urchin of the Writing Stars, by M. A. McAllister. <clears throat> Chapter 1. From the highest point of Watchtop Hill, Urchin could see the whole island. For days, squirrels and hedgehogs had been dragged, ru uh, have, have dragged rough branches up this hill. The wood for their bonfire was ready to light now, stacked up so high that Urchin knew he had to climb it. He was old enough to manage it, and young enough to want to. Swiftly springing from one branch to the next, twirling his tail to balance himself, he reached the very top, gripping with his hind claws and dusted moss from his fur. He was still as pale as honey, with the red squirrel color only uh, at the tips of his ears and tail. When he straightened up, shook his ears, and looked out over Miss Mantle, he felt he was a lord of the island. Tonight would be the night of riding stars. The animals would gather here as the air turned cool, light the bonfire, and watch the stars swirl and dance through the darkening sky, and guess at what things would happen next. Anemone Wood spread out below him to the south, with the first touch of autumn turning the leaves to crisp gold. Further away on the shore, otters chased each other in play. A line of small rowboats bobbed in the water. Urchin could never understand why otters were so fond of boats, as they swam so powerfully. Maybe they just liked anything to do with water. A tall ship was moored by the jetty, with its sails furled and its paintings figurehead gleamed with color in the sunlight. A work party of squirrels and otters had been lined up to unload it, passing crate after crate along the line. Urchin guessed at what might be in the crates. Wool for cloaks, maybe. Paint for the workshops. Or rare, rare wine for King Rush and sellers. sellers. Tomorrow, Tomorrow he, he would, would be down, down there, doing real run of work, helping to load the ship with timber. He didn't, didn't really want to think about, about tomorrow. Balancing and curling his hind claws, he turned a little farther to gaze as far out over the treetops of Miss Mantle Tower, and his heart stretched out to it. The tower was the place he longed for. On a high outcrop of rock gleamed it in pink, in shell pink, white, and in pale sandstone yellow that was almost gold. Miss Mantle Tower rose like a statue in the sky. From a turret, a pendant fluttered, a pendant fluttered in the breeze. A young female squirrel was hopping up the steps carrying something in a basket. And the moles on guard stood back to let her in. She might be one of the queen's attendants. Urchin envied her. Even then, we read the kitchen mole who appeared in the low window and threw dirty water into a drain. From, From the, the king, king of the throne room to the king kitchen mole in the scullery, life in the tower must be wonderful. He'd been, been there, of course. All of his mental creatures were invited to the tower for great occasions, like the spring festival. Apple said that when she was little, there had been all sorts of wonderful feasts and festivals with banquets, music, and garlands. That air wasn't so much of that now, but at least Urchin knew what it was like to stand in the vast gathering chamber of the tower. He had been there for the naming ceremony of Prince Tumble, the only child of King Brush and Queen Spindle. It seemed that all the island creatures were crammed in the tower that day. Wonderful, wonderful threadings hung from the walls, stitched and woven pictures showing stories of the island, but there was neither room nor time to take a good look at them. E even in following the crowd up the stairs had been confusing. Urchin had wondered how anyone ever found their way out. The procession had been magnificent. The animals of the circle had entered first. Then there had been any gap of admiration as the three captains of the mismantles stood proudly down the hall with gold and silver lettering in their robes and in circuits of gold on their heads. First Husk the Squirrel, and Crispin the Squirrel, and Padre the Otter. And Brother Fur had followed them, limping his plain white tunic. Then at last, tall, strong, and splendid, came King Brushin with Queen Spindle at his side, and all the colors of a jewel house gleaming from their mantles. And the Queen's friend, Lady Aspen the Squirrel, with the bright-eyed, wriggling baby, hedgehog, Prince Tumble in her arms. Finally, with every animal stretched up on his claw tip, Brother Fur had lifted up Prince Tumble and blessed him. Urchin had not been back to the tower since. He looked past it, he looked past it into the enchanted mist that had surrounded and protected the island so well that few ships ever reached it. Islanders who belonged here, if they left by water, could never return by water. The mist would prevent it. 
the others took care to row their boats beyond the midst. He was trying to work out how long it would be until nightfall when a fur came and hit him on the shoulder. He's showing off, said the squirrel voice. Ignore him, said the another. Two other squirrels had reached the hilltop, Leaner and Crackle. They were never apart and always looked at Urchin as if they had just been planning something very nasty for him. Crackle seemed to go on her way to make trouble, but Leaner did it without even trying. Urchin looked past and saw their animals working their way up the hill, the squirrels taking shortcuts as they leapt from one tree to the next. Leaner and Crackle were old were followed by Urchin's great friend Needle, a hedgehog, with unusually sharp spikes and prickles, and her not too close was a scampering, clambering bunch of very young squirrels, barely old enough to get up into the watchtower, and all without being carried. Beyond them, Urchin's foster mother, Apple, lumbled up the hill, keeping mostly the path. When she did jump on a branch, it bent alarmingly. Urchin! squeezed the small old squirrel in excitement. It's Urchin! cried another, bounding forward. Wait, Wait there, there, called Urchin. If, if he climbed up, if they, they climbed up to meet him, they'd probably bring the whole heap down on themselves. So he sprang down to them. He was popular with young squirrels, and in no time they were swarming over him. One he rides on his back, and holding up their paws to be swung around. Needle came and beside him. There's Captain Crispin on the beach, he said, and Captain Padra. Urchin looked down to the store, shore and saw Padra and other lolo popping. Uh, and it's from water and rolling into the sand dr- to dry his wet fur. Captain Crispin stood by, holding his cloak. All three captains had been friends since they were small. In time, they had been chosen to be pages of the tower, then promoted into the circle, and now they were captains, the highest rank on the island. Captain Husk was the king's most trusted friend and advisor, and mostly stayed in the tower. Captain Padre had always been taking special care of the shores and the creatures who lived by water, but Crispin took a particular care for the woodlands and the anemone wood creatures. He even appeared to take interest in Urchin. He was Urchin's hero. If, any, if anyone asked Urchin what he'd like to be, he would have truthfully said, I want to be like Captain Crispin. But he wouldn't have told anyone that. It was a treasure dream, not to be spoken. They'd only laugh. Besides, no one had asked him. He'd been loaning timber on his ships for the rest of his life. The youngest of the little squirrels had fallen over and was whimpering. Urchin picked her up and sat on the log with the squirrel's lap, and Needle beside him. Isn't it wonderful up here, said Needle. Look at that ship. Then she looked down her paws. Sorry. It's all right, said Urchin. I don't mind. He knew that she had not meant to remind him of his future loading and unloading ships. Crackle popped up behind them. Oh, so Needle's still speaking to us, she said. You don't want to talk to him, Needle. He'll, he'll, he's just joining a common work party. And you're a tower hedgehog. You'll be off to the workrooms tomorrow, won't you? Painting, weaving, sewing, making threadings, goodness knows what else. Very talented, aren't we? Very privileged. Much too good to speak to the rest of us. Needle turned quickly. Out, said Crackle. Oh, did you get caught on my spines? asked Needle politely. You shouldn't get clo- uh, too close to me. Ignore her, Urgent. You must be looking forward to tomorrow, said Urgent. I haven't liked to talk about it, Needle said awkwardly. What, because you've been chosen for training at the tower and I haven't, said Urgent. Talk all you like, I'm very glad for you. It's just that he looked at the shore again. Captain Crisper and was no longer there. A few squirrels and otters sat on the jetty, dabbing their paws in the water. I had dreams, he said quickly and quietly. Sometimes I think I'm meant to do something special. He wriggled his paws. Maybe it's because of not knowing who I am. I don't know how I got here or where from. I don't know who my parents are or were, and I don't even like look like the rest of you. Apple always told me I was special. I used to think perhaps I'd been chosen for something. I... You won't laugh, will you? Of course not, said Neil. He wouldn't have said this to anyone but Neil. Even with her, it wasn't easy. I was born on a night riding stars, he said. Wonderful things are supposed to happen after those nights, but I don't think anything very exciting followed that one. It was as if, well, it was as if I was what happened. And I was sent here that night, and I have something vital to do. I And I've tried really hard at everything I've ever done. I knew... I knew I wasn't ready for a dismantled squirrel, and I'd have uh, to make an effort to become one. 
and I have made the, the effort. effort. But, but I've, I've got, got nothing, nothing to show for it, nothing except loading ships for the rest of my life. What makes, what makes you think it's for the rest of your life, asked Neil. You, you might go on to... She stopped, as Apple finally appeared at the top of the hill. She was looking down at more and ship when she got her breath back. Unloading boats, she grumbled and flopped down heavily beside the eel and urchin. The log rocked and the little squirrel squeaked. It's all wrong, this. They never used to do this way. They never had no work parties, and that all the work that needed to be got done all the t same. And we had a lot more fun in them days. Urchin and Needle grinned swiftly at each other. There was no point in arguing, or in speaking at all, once Apple had something to say. The boats all got unloaded, and loaded up too, and all the nuts and berries that... They had got gathered up and stored, and all the makings of cloaks and cordials and fishing, and the works of boats were looking at the tower and making medicines, and keeping our ne ne nests nice, all that, and it all got done. And these days, it's all work parties, isn't it? She looked around for support. Isn't it, though? Yes, Apple, said Neil. It's work parties all the time now, and before you're up in the mornings, it's all the West Shore otters reporting for Benchcombin, and all the anemone wood squirrels to report for cone stores, and I don't know what else. Here, ur here's Urchin looking after them little ones. Hello, little ones, climbing trees, all the things he should be doing at his age, and tomorrow he's got to go and load timber, squeaked a gleaner, and giggled. Needle spines bristles. And what work will you be doing, gleaner, she asked sweetly. They haven't told me yet, said Gleaner with a w w wriggle and a shrug. They're still thinking about me. They may be considering me to work in the tower, she wriggled again. Of course, I don't suppose I'll get in, but it's very nice to be considered. Who said you were being considered, asked Needle. Mind your own business, snapped Gleaner, and added a whisper. You could have been cold at birth. Cold, said Urchin. That's not funny. There's another thing that never used to happen in the old days, said Apple crossly. There was no culling. The small squirrel twisted to look at Urchin. What's culling? she asked. Never never you mind, bless your little ears, said Apple. There was a mole baby taken to be culled last week, said Crackle loudly. That's enough out of you, said Apple. But it's kind, isn't it, to kill the weak ones? And Gleaner as Needle took the little squirrel by the paw and dragged her away to play. It's cruel to let them live if they're weak, or if they're not right. Far more sensible to kill them off. They do they do them in very quickly. They dope them first, don't they? said Crackle. You just be quiet, snapped Apple over her shoulder. It's a terrible thing. We never used to do it in the old days. Gleaner sat up very straight. It's the king's law, she said indignantly. You can't say the king's wrong. All mismantled animals were fiercely loyal to the king, and always had been. Turning against the king was unthinkable. Hedgehogs especially were famous for their loyalty and hard work, just as otters were known for their courage and good humor, and squirrels were uh, for their very bright spirits. Moles were so much underground it could be difficult to get them to know them at all, but they were very determined and reliable. He's a good king, a good king, agreed Apple firmly. He just got some funny laws, that's all. Like that, she glanced up at the little squirrel who had escaped from Needle and he was climbing up Urchin's leg. The law we were just talking about, and them work parties. And them's not good laws. In fact, the thing we're talking about, that's a bad law. And there's no good in it, can't be. And he's just a good king, a right good king. But them laws just ain't good laws. And that's it. All, he's got some bad laws. Pardon, said Urchin. Oh, don't make her say it again, sighed Gleaner. I wish they wouldn't, though, said Needle quietly. My mum's having another baby, and I just hope and hope and pray that it's all right. I couldn't bear if it... Urchin looked down at the small squirrel, which he was staring at something a little way off. The baby should be all right, he said. But even babies that are just a bit weak and or small might get cut old, she said, or a teeny bit lame or short-sighted. What's the little one staring at, demanded Apple loudly. Oh my goodness, it's him! It's Captain Crispin, exclaimed Urchin. He jumped to his hind paws and nearly dropped the little squirrel at Captain Crispin, leaped from the tree and landed on the hilltop. Good morning, he called. What a splendid woodpile. As a captain, he wore a gold circuit on his head and a belted sword on his hip. Thrilled and flustered at the same time, Urchin bowed awkwardly and wondered if his fur was dirty or sticking up. That, that was the trouble with being pale, the dirt showed. 
and he wished he'd been found doing something more impressive than looking after a toddler. He stammered a good morning. Apple curtsies and wobbled a bit. Good morning, Captain Crispin. Lovely morning. Captain Crispin, sir, we've built our bonfire, sir. We're all ready for the stars tonight. We'll be having a grand supper up here. I've brought some of my apple and mint cordial. Would you like some cordial, sir? Merchant's claws curled in embarrassment. Apple's curdle was famous for repelling insects, but it tasted terrible. Thank you, Mr. Sapple, but I'll do without the pleasure today, said Crispin. But I'd like to speak to young Urchin, if I may. Urchin, will you come to with me? Urchin, astonished, tried to stammer a reply. He glanced at Apple for help, but didn't get any, and only just remembered to hand the young squirrel to Needle. He dusted his fur as he ran to Captain Crispin's side, and they walked down the hill path. Crispin asked that Urchin how Apple was, and what work had been chosen for him, and how the ap autumn for harvest gathering was doing. While well, Urchin tried it, it, to guess at what the best answers would be, and to say something intelligent without showing off. But Captain Crispin was so friendly and natural that in time he forgot to be shy. Finally, Crispin turned to him and asked, Will you be on Oddstop Hill tonight to watch the stars? Oh yes, sir, said Urchin. Only if you like to, you could come to the tower, said Crispin. Captain Padre and I are going to Brother Fur's turret room to watch from there. Probably the best view in the island. You're invited if you'd like to join us. Urchin felt a shiver of joy through his fur, even though he was sure he must have misheard. He opened his mouth, but nothing came out. Finally, he managed to say, Me, sir? The tower? Certainly you, Urchin, if they can manage you here without you, said Crispin. And if you don't mind missing the bonfire, make your way to the tower around twilight. I'll tell the guards to expect you. They'll direct you to first turret. Thank you, sir, grasped Urchin. Thank you, Urchin. And Crispin, said Crispin, and with a leap he was bounding down the hill. Urchin was watched him until he was out of sight, then ran full tilt to the nearest tree, shined, uh, shinnied up it, and turned... Uh, Earned somersaults for pure joy. A night of riding stars, the tower, and Crispin.